All right, so what is a sourdough starter? So you can see this is my sourdough starter, a time lapse of it over the course of four or five hours in a proofing container. And it looks very much alive, it's growing, it's doubling in size, and it's full of all of these bubbles. And that's because it pretty much is a living organism. It's a symbiotic culture of bacteria and wild yeast that can leaven bread. And this is the way that bread was made for thousands of years before the development of instant and active dry yeast in the 20th century, which was due, uh, which was pretty much the most active strains of sourdough that scientists took to give the soldiers out in the battlefield so they could quickly leaven bread. Thank you, Zoe, and thank you all and Norwell for coming out. This is great attendance here. Um, I do this workshop all across the state or the Commonwealth. Um, and you know, I'm going back and forth traveling, and it's so great to meet people that are interested in sourdough baking who have maybe don't know anything about it, maybe people that have kind of you know, had a little foray into sourdough, and then they killed their sourdough starter, um, or maybe people that are expert sourdough bakers. I've met all of those people all across the state, so it was really great to meet some of you all. And um, you know, we always have lots of times for questions at the end, so I'll be sure to stick around for you all as well. Um, but the intro to sourdough baking you have to have a sourdough starter. And that is the foundation of all of your sourdough baking. And so this workshop is all about how to make, maintain, and store a sourdough starter and what you need to get going. So a little bit about myself. Uh, so we already mentioned some of this, but I live out in Western Massachusetts in a small town, um, one of the hill towns in Granville, Massachusetts. And I'm a full-time sourdough food blogger. So I put all of my recipes, um, guides, and tips on my website, sourdoughbrandon.com. And I bake everything in my home kitchen as well as photograph, and film everything that I do on social media in my home kitchen. And so um, my mantra is, you know, if I can do this in my own home kitchen, I want you all to make delicious bread or other baked goods in your home kitchens as well. So everything on my website is really detailed. I try to put as many photos or videos when it's possible um, to make it really easy because I know that sourdough baking can be intimidating. There's a lot of language. We're going to talk about a lot of challenging stuff maybe um, to some of you all it might sound like. But really, it's very simple. Um, and it's a process that's been done for thousands of years. So I want you all to be able to go to my website and have all of the tools and the information that you need to succeed in the kitchen. All right. So here's an overview of all the things that we're going to be talking about today. And you know, at the end, there's time for a Q&A. So if you can save your questions for the end, um, that's really helpful just to make sure that we can get through everything. Um, and just so you know, everything is on my website here that's in this presentation um, on sourdoughbrand.com. I have a sourdough starter recipe. Uh, so if you want to make a sourdough starter from scratch, I have a day-by-day walkthrough with a lot of the same photos. I have other guides and tips that you'll see um, in this presentation also on my website. So everything that you can find there, you can find on my website. And I'll give you my contact information. I know I have some materials in the back, but I'll give you my email and contact information at the end as well. Feel free to you know, contact me with any questions or anything like that you have. So an overview of what we're going to be going over, we're going to talk about exactly what is a sourdough starter um, and what can you make with a sourdough starter. So you may know about sourdough bread, but did you know that you can make other things with sourdough, not just sourdough bread? And then why, what's the big hoopla about sourdough? Why do people use sourdough starter? Why would you want to use it? And then we'll, then we'll do a day-by-day -day walkthrough with the equipment and the ingredients that you need to make a sourdough starter from scratch. But FYI, you're leaving with active sourdough starter in the back. So keep that in mind that you don't have to make one from scratch unless you want to, because you're going to leave with some of my sourdough starter, and I give you all the directions on how to make your sourdough starter um, and maintain your sourdough starter that you have. And so we'll talk about how to maintain it. We'll talk about how to adjust the feeding. So you may have heard that sourdough starter is like a pet, and you have to feed it all the time. That's partly true, but you, there's also lots of storage options, so you don't have to feed it every single day. Let's talk about the storage options. Um, and then we'll talk about something called sourdough discard, some of the recipes that you can make with that. Um, and I'll go into more detail about what that means a little bit later. So storage options. And then we'll do some helpful tools. I have one here um, that I like to use in my home kitchen that I think is helpful for home bakers. And then we'll have the Q&A at the end. All right, so what is a sourdough starter? So you can see this is my sourdough starter, a time lapse of it over the course of four or five hours in a proofing container. And it looks very much alive. It's growing. 
It's doubling in size, and it's full of all of these bubbles. And that's because it pretty much is a living organism. It's a symbiotic culture of bacteria and wild yeast that can leaven bread. And this is the way that bread was made for thousands of years before the development of instant and active dry yeast in the 20th century, which was, due, uh, which was pretty much the most active strains of sourdough that scientists took to give the soldiers out in the battlefield so they could quickly leaven bread. So that's how people made bread um, before the development of fast-acting yeast in the 20th century. And at the very basic core level, it's just flour and water that's left to ferment over time. Um, it's really basic, and we'll talk about, you know, the only ingredients that you need to make a great sourdough starter is just flour and water. If you're interested in, like, the more scientific side of making a sourdough starter, it is just yeast consuming the carbohydrates in the flour, and then there are various byproducts in that fermentation process. So there's many different byproducts, but one is CO2, so that's the leavening, carbon dioxide. This is the gases that are forming, and this helps the bread rise. You see it rising in the bubbles, that's carbon dioxide in the sourdough starter. And another byproduct is lactic acid, which helps contribute to the sour flavor, or the acidic flavor, the complexity of sourdough that it's notorious for, and it also helps preserve the bread to last longer than other like fast-acting breads that may go bad or stale after a couple of days. There are various other byproducts as well, um, but those are the two main ones, CO2 and lactic acid. And I'll just say, you know, sourdough is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, think of sourdough as like a process, not necessarily a type of bread. And I know in English we say sourdough, so people think that sourdough bread has to be sour tasting, but that's not the case. Um, it can have lots of different flavors, and you can affect the fermentation, or through fermentation, you can affect the flavors of your bread to be more or less sour. And so we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, but it all kind of starts here with your sourdough starter. And San Francisco has a little bit of a marketing monopoly on sourdough starter and or sourdough bread, um, and they say that theirs tastes the best, but I'm here to tell you that you can make great tasting sourdough bread wherever you are in the world. It's just the wild yeast that are everywhere um, that surround us, and you can make a sourdough starter wherever you are. So why use a sourdough starter? What's the big ruckus about? Uh, so one is that it can last forever with proper maintenance and storage, and a lot of people pass down their sourdough starters as heirlooms. Um, I was just in a presentation in Hanover, and someone said that he had his grandfather's sourdough starter that he's been keeping for like 80 years in the family. Um, so a lot of people do that with their sourdough starters, especially when you make one from scratch. I think it's a really nice tool to keep as an heirloom. They have found sourdough starter in like ancient Egyptian tombs and revived it somehow. So I'm just, you know, it's very resilient. Um, and I know people, I talked to some people and they said they killed their starter. So I don't know. If you can keep, if ancient Egyptian tombs, if you can find sourdough starter there, I think you can keep one alive. So, <laughs> um, I mean, and I would eat that bread, right? Like. I would, I would try it at least. I don't know if it would be good after like an ancient sourdough, but I would still try it. Um, but for me, I think the, you know, the number one reason why I use sourdough is kind of for better flavor. Uh, sourdough homemade bread just tastes so much better than store-bought bread. And it, like I said earlier, it doesn't have to necessarily be sour. Um, my breads tend to be a little bit more mild in flavor, but they do have a complexity to them. And your sourdough starter will kind of start to take on different aromas and smells and flavors based on the types of flowers that you're feeding it and even the water and your, lo your geographic location. Some claim that there are health benefits to using a sourdough starter and making sourdough breads, um, like easier digestion, blood sugar levels, so it helps with not raising your glycemic index as fast there. Um, and some with gluten intolerances are able, are able to consume sourdough breads and um, have a better time with it. So that's just some health benefits that people claim. Another is to connect with the traditional bread making practices and just kind of getting your hands in to know how bread is made and the process that was done for thousands of years, like throughout human history, the oldest food um, that we know of, and how to kind of start making some bread from scratch. The longer shelf life I talked about a little bit earlier from the lactic acid. And then I think for all ages, it's a really great hobby or experiment or chore to have. So maybe, you know, you th talked about having a pet. You know, maybe you don't want to get the dog if you're unsure if, you know, the kid's going to feed the dog every day. But with the sourdough starter, it's not as big of a deal if you don't feed the sourdough starter <laughs> every day. So it's a really great chore or hobby to have. Um, and for a lot of people, it starts off as a hobby, and then they get really into it. Um, and it's like a little science, science experiment. I mean, it's a little living culture on your kitchen counter. And then lastly, I think if you enjoy being in the kitchen, you like baking, um, Baking your own bread from scratch will just make you an overall better baker. I'll talk about some of the things when you're making a sourdough starter or making breads um, that go into the process that will 
you know, automatically translate into being better in the kitchen, cooking better, baking a little bit better. So I think, I know speaking personally, making sourdough bread is maybe a better baker overall. So what can you make with a sourdough starter? So of course there are breads, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, but I don't want you to think about only sourdough breads. You can make sourdough more as a process. Think of about it as more of a process and not just the specific types of breads that you're making. So first of all, you can make breads. So within that category, though, there's so many different types of breads. You can use um, whole wheat flours or ancient grains like einkorn or spelt flour or flours that you've never even heard of, gluten-free flours you can make with a gluten-free sourdough starter. Um, and so, you know, there's just that one little category within breads. But then within breads, you also have brioche breads, so like buttery and rich breads. You have challah or babkas or uh, baguettes. You know, there's so many different types of breads that you can make. And I often add inclusions in some of my recipes to my breads to, you know, just kind of spice up the flavors. Um, for example, I had a sun-dried tomato um, bread that I released recently that tastes like pizza um, without any cheese in it, actually. But it tastes just like pizza. Um, so there's a lot of fun with things that you can do just within that bread category with sourdough. But then outside of the, you know, bread category, you have just any other leaven to bake goods that you would typically use instant or active dry yeast in, or maybe that you would find in a bakery that would be leavened, you can put sourdough in them. So some recipes, here, some images on my website and recipes that I have, just dinner rolls. These are like pulled apart rosemary dinner rolls. They're really great for Thanksgiving. Um, and I make these all the time. They're really excellent and buttery. You can make cinnamon rolls like here, buns, yeasted donuts, croissants. I have a sourdough croissant recipe on my website. Um, bagels, pizza doughs, anything that would be normally you would put yeast in, you can just substitute the yeast with sourdough starter. And then lastly, um, we'll talk more about what sourdough discard is, because it's a part of the process of maintaining a sourdough starter. But you can use your sourdough discard in unleavened recipes. So instead of wasting the starter so you don't have to throw away part of your starter, you can actually save it to use in recipes that need a mechanical leavener, like baking powder or baking soda. So you could use them, in, you could use the sourdough discard in, say, biscuits or waffles, pancakes, etc. So the equipment that you need to make a sourdough starter from scratch, so simple. And these are the, this is the same equipment that you're going to need for maintaining your starter as well. Um, and I have some of my favorites here um, that I'll kind of talk through. But first, I think the number one tool that I recommend for all home bakers to have is a kitchen scale. This is like $20 on Amazon, but it is like the most used item in my kitchen probably. Um, so measuring your ingredients by weight in grams, that's how I weigh things, will immediately make all of your baking way more consistent, accurate, and help you replicate recipes better that a, that a baker wants you to bake. And that's because sourdough starter, flour, weigh differently from person to person. And you know, the standard like US cups that we have of like a cup of flour, those aren't actually standard, unfortunately. <laughs> so everyone measures a cup of flour differently. And that includes some people scoop their flour and, and level it off. Some people don't level it off. Some people fluff up their flour before they measure it. Some people spoon their flour in. You know, there's a million different ways that people measure flour. And on a very basic level, it might not seem that big of a difference. But when you're thinking about scaling up a recipe like breads that may require many, many cups of flour, suddenly you've added an extra cup or maybe you didn't add enough flour for your recipe because 20 or 40 grams times four or five, you suddenly have an extra cup of flour or not in one bread recipe. So when you're baking and something's not turning out right, especially with sourdough, which is just a little bit more sensitive to some of these things, if you're not measuring by weight, you know, that's going to be a big, a big issue here. So scale, number one tool, highly recommended, affordable, and um, will just make all of your baking a lot better. And then secondly is just a normal glass jar. So I have some of my favorites here. Um, you want a jar that has flat sides and a flat bottom so it's easy to clean. I prefer glass because it's dishwasher safe. And in this, this jar, this is called a weck jar. It's a canning like mason jar, essentially. They're a little bit more popular in Europe. Um, but they have these nice little lids that sit right on top. So then fruit flies don't get in, but it's still a little bit breathable. So your starter, if it needed, um, is still producing all of these gases. You don't want it to like explode. Not going to happen. It's not going to explode. But, <laughs> but it can overflow the container. And so you don't want to have it sealed in. Like it has a sealant like this one does. 
um, it has a sealant, and you just don't want it to be so tight that it could pop open or um, or explode. <laughs> um, so yeah, so these are really great jars, these wet jars, and I have a smaller one here that's really great for a small starter. Um, this is another type of jar that um, another company called Sour House makes, and it has um, a little like silicone lid that lets it be breathable on top. It has a little rubber band, like elastic here. Um, it has a little dot so you can tell how much it's risen or not. And then this one's a little bit more complex for those that are like nerdy, I guess. Um, so this is one from the website is called Cultures for Health. Um, it has this little canvas top in here, and it also has um, like the weight, how many milliliters, how many grams, I think. Or no, it just has milliliters because it's like um, by volume. And then it also has a, like a timer that you can move and adjust to say, like, I fed this at Wednesday at 6 a.m. or whenever you fed your starter so you can know it. Um, so that's for those that are like, you know, want to be a little bit more detailed. But you could use a regular mason jar, or you could use an old jam jar or something like that. One time I used a pickle jar, and my sourdough starter smelled like pickles. So I don't recommend that. But you know, there's any type of glass jar is going to work well for you. If you do decide to use like a regular mason jar, I recommend not using the metal jars because it's really acidic and it will start to corrode the metal lids. So use a plastic, the like plastic lids, or um, or you could do like cheesecloth or a coffee filter on top of it with a rubber band. Those will work as well. You just want to keep fruit flies out. And then lastly is a spatula. Uh, you could use a spoon as well, but I prefer the silicone spatulas because they're really easy to clean. Um, this comes in, this red one comes in like a pack of five or six on Amazon, I think. Um, and then this is another one that came for this um, larger one as well. But you want like flat, straight sides that are easy to scoop and clean the starter and, and mix everything, stir everything in. It's like pancake batter. So it's, think of that type of consistency. So these silicone spatulas do the best for you. And then the ingredients that you need to make a sourdough starter from scratch and maintain your starter are just flour and water. All you need is flour and water. I know some people add fruit to their starters to get them going. That's because there's natural yeast in those things. But really, all you need is flour and water because it has all of the tools and the ingredients that you need to get a starter going. But these are my recommended ingredients to get a sourdough starter started from scratch. And the first one is bread flour, and that's because I like to get my starter adjusted to the flour that I'm going to be feeding it most often with. So I'm making breads the most often, and so I like to feed it bread flour. But you could use all-purpose flour if you're using all-purpose flour the most. So my favorite and what I recipe test with the most is King Arthur bread flour. Um, they have an organic option of this as well, um, but this is a high-protein bread flour. It's unbleached. They're a really great company. They have a 24-7 like, hotline that you can call. Um, for any baking questions, I, I've never called it. I don't know if anyone ever has, but hopefully someone's on the other line answering it. Um, but they're also a B corporation, so they're employee-owned. They're based in Vermont. They have baking classes there. They're just a really great company, and their bread flour is really consistent from bag to bag, um, and not all bread flours at the store are like that. So I really recommend a high-quality, good bread flour, King Arthur, Bob's Red Mill. Um, and then there's another one here. I have a local option, which is Ground Up Grain. They're based in Western Massachusetts. Um, so you may not see it around stores here, but I know you can order it online. Um, and now in Western Mass, they're definitely popular in like co-ops and stuff. Um, but they stone mill all of their flours in Holyoke. Uh, so this is a really great local option as well. To start a sourdough starter from scratch, I really like to feed it rye flour. So this is like a vitamin boost to your sourdough starter. So you all are leaving with active starter. So you already have an active starter. You don't have to use rye flour to feed it. But if you're making one from scratch, it's just going to really expedite the process by a lot because there's more um, nutrients and soluble sugars that the sourdough yeast just really love in rye flour. If you've ever tasted a rye bread, it's really dense. And it has lots of flavor in it. Um, so just think about your sourdough yeast having a personality and eating that and being like, nom, nom, nom. You know? like, it's really going to like the rye flour. Um, so I use that when I'm starting a starter from scratch. And then the last is just water. And if you can drink the water, then you can feed your sourdough starter with the water. I have well water. I've used, um, that's what I have now. But I've used distilled water. I've used filtered water. I've used Boston tap water. It's all OK as long as you feel comfortable drinking it. I think your sourdough starter is going to be OK as well. So on the first day of making a sourdough starter from scratch, all you have to do is mix flour and water together and let it set for a day. And you just repeat this process until you have a starter, which sounds really easy. So what I do is 25 grams each of bread flour and rye flour, so half and half 
of those, and that's about a quarter cup each, and I feed it an equal amount of water, so 50 grams of water or about half a cup, and I just stir it together like pancake batter in a glass jar, cover it loosely with the lid, set it on top, and let it set for 24 hours. Ideally, this is in a warm environment, slightly warmer than room temperature. So sourdough starter does best in this temperature range of 75 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. It's like a Goldilocks zone for sourdough yeast. So if you're proofing breads um, or you're making a sourdough starter and maintain your starter at its most healthy active state, it's in that temperature range. So some locations that people like to use are maybe on top of a refrigerator that can be a little bit warmer or another appliance. If you have a second floor, um, you know, you can put it up there if it's warmer in the summer. During the summertime, you can keep your sourdough starter out on the counter if it's, you know, decently warm in your kitchen, but during the winter, it might be cooler. So I have a drafty old, you know, New England house that was built in like the 1850s. So <laughs> during the winter time, um, it's a little bit cooler in my kitchen. So I have like a
it's a whole grain, whole wheat, and because I'm not sifting out any of the bran or the germ in the wheat berries, so it will rise a lot faster if you start milling your own flour. And then lastly is the ratio of ingredients that you are leaving in your container to feed your starter. So if you leave a large seed culture of your starter in its container, it's going to eat through the flour and water a lot faster because there's a larger amount of sourdough starter in there. But if you leave a small amount in, like the amount that I gave you, and you feed it a larger ratio of flour and water, it will take longer to ferment. So a lot of bakers, you might see this online, and that's why I include it. If it's confusing, don't worry about it. Um, but it's like a ratio that you use. So one, one, one ratio is equal parts flour, water, and sourdough starter. So that's typically ready in four or five hours in a warm location. And it will need to be fed more often if, you're, if you have 30 grams of flour, 30 grams of water, and 30 grams of starter, that's going to be ready in a few hours. Whereas if you have a ratio like 166, and this is the amount that I'm recommending that you all feed and how I typically feed my starter, it's ready in 12 plus hours. Uh, so that's 5 grams of starter and then times 6. So 30 grams of flour and 30 grams of water. So the ratios you can play with to decide, I want my starter to rise faster or slower based on how much starter or how much flour and water I'm, I'm how much starter I'm leaving in there and how much flour and water I'm going to feed it. So you have your starter going, and it's healthy and it's active, and you want to make bread. What I do before baking is I make an offshoot of my starter. So I remove some of it, and I make this offshoot called a levain. And this is essentially a separate sourdough starter, and it has a lot of benefits. And all of my recipes for breads are written this way um, for these various reasons. So the starter is always fed the same way. The starter is the mother culture, and it likes that consistent feeding schedule, just like you like to wake up in the morning and brush your teeth and take a shower and all of the consistent things that keep us regular and ha happy and healthy. The sourdough likes that as the starter likes that as well. So wake up, have a routine to feed your starter if you're leaving it out every day. And then you can also build the exact size that you need it to be if you make a levain. So I will say in my recipes, when you feed your starter, you have your levain. This is exactly what you need for the levain, and 100% of it goes into your, into your bread recipe or whatever recipe you're making. So in this example, is 30 grams of sourdough starter, 30 grams of bread flour, and 30 grams of water. I've told you exactly how much starter you need to make this levain. All of that, 100% of that, goes into the recipe. And then lastly, another benefit of using a levain is that you can feed it different flours. So here's an example of a buckwheat sourdough starter or buckwheat levain that I made for a buckwheat bread that I made. And so I can you feed this levain, this offshoot of my sourdough starter with buckwheat flour, which actually doesn't have any wheat in it, and put it into my buckwheat bread. And all of this goes into my buckwheat recipe, so there's no leftover, there's no discard here. I just make it one time, it goes all into the recipe. And then my mother culture is still fed the same way, and she hasn't been fed buckwheat flour because that could affect the fermentation and the, the kind of health of the starter because it likes consistency. So if you want to make whole wheat flours or you want to make a rye bread or, or something else like that using, um, or if you want to make say like a sweet sourdough starter uh, without affecting the mother culture, you could add a little bit of sugar into a levain and it doesn't affect the mother culture. And then you could use that levain in like a cinnamon roll recipe if it's a sweet starter. So here are the couple of options. So I just talked about this one here um, on the right. So making a levain. Find a recipe that makes a levain. A lot of the books that you'll find probably here in the library, a lot of recipes on online will tell you how to make the levain. Um, this is my preferred method, and all my leavened recipes will write out a levain like this. Um, and you typically, these are at 1, 1, 1 ratios. And it's ready in four or five hours. So I make it in the morning, and then in the afternoon, then I have enough. Um, so it's great for like a weekend schedule. That's how I do it. And then I will add it into the bread. And then you feed your starter as normal in that process. The other option that you have is what other people do. And this is you just have a crock or a large amount of sourdough starter, and you just build up your sourdough starter, maintain it, very large starter, and you just scoop it off however much you need for your recipe. Um, you know, I've talked about the benefits of a levain, and I think that there's, you know, you don't have to feed it. There's less waste um, in this process. So that's why I like to do it. But this is another very viable way that you can make great tasting bread. And you know, just find a recipe that tells you you need 100 grams or 120 grams of starter or something like that for a recipe, and just build your starter up big enough to cover that amount. And you always have to remember if you do that that you have to leave some extra so that your starter will um, remain that way. So in the process, 
of feeding your starter, I talked about sourdough discard. Um, so to maintain the size of your starter so it doesn't get too big or overwhelming, you don't have to keep feeding it flour and water because it's always hungry, it seems like. Um, um, you do have to remove a portion of the starter, but you don't have to actually waste it. So it, it's a little bit also of a misnomer um, to call it discard because you don't have to discard it. Um, so you can compost it, you could dry it out and feed it to chickens. Um, I do that, they really like that. You can store the discard in a container for a couple of weeks in the refrigerator and then use it in non-leavened recipes. So things like cookies, waffles, pancakes, pie crust, I've used discard in. I have recipes for these on my website and there's some images of like my sourdough discard chocolate chip cookies. Um, so they have baking, excuse me, uh, they have baking powder and baking soda in them instead of the, um, and, and sourdough discard, but they don't use the sourdough as the leavening agent. It's just, I'm using mechanical leaveners there. And the same thing for like my quick breads or a cake, it's like baking powder and baking soda are doing the work here. And the sourdough discard is used as you would use like sour cream, buttermilk, or another acidic ingredient like that in a recipe. So this is um, just a little page that I have on the differences between some of these terms that I've talked about because you know, people use different words or terminology, you may see them thrown around. So um, this is just kind of reviewing some of the things that I've already talked about. So the sourdough starter is the mother culture um, that's fed regularly and it can last indefinitely. Sourdough discard is a portion of the mother cultures that's discarded or removed during feeding in order to maintain the size of your starter. You can store it for a couple of weeks in the refrigerator and you can use it in non-leavened recipes. And then the levain is the offshoot of your starter that you can feed with different flours, and 100% of it goes into a recipe uh, for making bread. So thinking about how to store your starter, I talked about I keep mine out at room temperature and I feed it every single day, but you don't have to do that process. So if you bake more than once, a, if you bake more than once a week, then I do recommend that because I'm baking a lot and I'm always recipe testing, so I, that's why I leave my sourdough starter out. But for a lot of people, you don't need to do that. Uh, if you bake less than once a week, I would recommend storing it in the refrigerator. So during that time, you would feed it, let it set for a couple of hours to get the yeast and the sourdough kind of activity moving, and then store it in the refrigerator for a couple of weeks. Some people have done longer, but I don't recommend that because then you forget about it and, you know, someone ends up throwing it away because they think it's, you know, old yogurt or something in your refrigerator. <laughs> um, but yeah, so then you can store it in the refrigerator that way and you can keep that process going so you can take it out of the refrigerator um, let it set a little bit longer, feed it again, let it set a little bit, put it back in the refrigerator, or you could take it out of the refrigerator, get it going, get it happy and healthy again, and then use it to bake with. And then if you bake less often, I don't recommend freezing it because starter is like just really messy, and if you put it in like a bag, that's what a lot of people do when they freeze it, it's just like really hard, you have to thaw it out, it's just really nasty kind of. Um, so if you bake less often, I really recommend drying it out. Uh, this is what dried starter looks like. And you can grind it up into like a little powder. Um, but what I like to do is just use a spatula, spread it out on a thin piece of on parchment paper very thinly, let it dry out for, it might take 12 hours, it might take a day, depending on how humid or arid it is. Um, and you'll have these little flakes of starter that you can break apart. And you know they just come off like little, little chips of starter. Um, and then you can just keep them in like a container for indefinitely. You can keep it in a bag. Uh, this is like an old rice container. So um, that way you can keep it indefinitely. So I really, really highly recommend that option. That's also my backup option. So say if someone accidentally knocked over my sourdough starter or um, some people like to keep their starter in the oven with the light on and just to keep it warmer, but then someone forgets that it's in there and then inevitably it gets baked. Um, <laughs> So um, so I really highly recommend drying it out for, for those, those reasons. So what to do with your starter? So you have the instructions on how to maintain your starter that I recommend, but here's the process kind of laid out here uh, for visual learners. So take your small amount of starter, it's like five grams or so, put it in another container, and then feed it about quarter cup each of flour and water, so 30 grams or so each of flour and water, and then let it set for a day, stir it up, let it set for a day. Um, and once it's doubled in size and it's full of bubbles and it seems happy, um, then you can discard most of it, leaving about the amount that you all have left in the container. So just scrape scraps in the jar left and then feed it again the same way. So I recommend that you do this at least for a couple of days just to make sure it works, uh, make sure that you like the process or not, decide if this is for you or not. 
and then also decide like, okay, now do I want to store this? Do I want to store it in the refrigerator or dry it out to bake at another later time? Or I'm going to build it up to bake with this. So if you want to bake this weekend, you could take your starter and feed it here for a couple of days, and then you could bake with it on Saturday, for example. Find a recipe um, that you would want to make. So if you get really into sourdough baking like I have, or maybe you've made a starter and it you know, failed because of, you think it was the temperature was the big problem, because I do think ambient temperature is the biggest, the biggest issue with sourdough baking or proofing. Um, or maybe you, you know, have been keeping your starter in the oven with the light on, like I just mentioned. Um, these are a couple of really helpful tools that I, that I found for home bakers that they really like and help you make better bread and make things more consistent. So one is Goldie, uh, which I have here. So you just plug this in. It kind of looks like the Beauty and the Beast rose, right? Um, but it's this nice little cloche, um, and this just comes right up, and you can put your sourdough starter jar right on top of this little pad. And it's almost like a germination mat, um, and it keeps it in your sourdough starter in that ambient temperature range, the Goldilocks zone, for between 75 and 80 degrees. And during the wintertime, this is what I use to put my starter in, and you just plug it in. It has a little gold light. They make jars specifically for it, which are really nice, the gold, see, Goldilocks? Yep, that's what the, the thing is. Um, so that's a really great little safe home for your sourdough starter that looks nice on the counter and doesn't take up much space. And then another is this Braun Taylor bread folding bread proofer. Um, so they're based out in Williamstown, Mass. And they um, have a lot of other great bread and other baking um, appliances. But this bread proofing box, you can set the exact temperature that you want things to proof in. You could put your sourdough starter in here, or you could put like breads that you're making in here. That's what I do. Um, and you know you could proof cinnamon rolls, croissants, like whatever you want in this little bread proofer, and it folds up, um, so it's not always out on your counter. And you can also it double acts as like a, a slow cooker as well, so you can make whatever you make in a slow cooker in that, like apple butter or something. All right, so let's do some questions here. Um, but first of all, you know this is the URL to the website sourdoughbrand.com, how to make a sourdough starter. If you need any of that information. Uh, my email is brandon at sourdoughbrandon.com, easy to remember. Feel free to ask any questions that you have. And then I'm on social media, so Instagram and Facebook are the main two ones that I'm on. And I love when people tag me in their bakes. I send out a monthly newsletter. It'll probably go out this Friday. If you sign up for the newsletter in the back, you'll get that. Um, but I have like a community bake of the month, so I post a recipe that someone on Facebook or Instagram or somewhere has tagged me on, um, just to, so you can see that the recipes work and that other people are making them every day. People are making my recipes all around the world. I had my croissants were being made in like a um, the Italian Alps at like some resort, and I was like, wow, that's amazing. That was from my home kitchen, and they were making them. So I love seeing that and sharing it with you all, so you feel inspired to maybe try something. Uh, thanks so much for coming out. Once again, the newsletter sign up is in the back, and I'm up here if you have more questions, of course. Mm -hmm.